The Lord be with you. I'm Pastor Clarence Rogers, recently retired pastor at St. John's Lutheran in Chatham. And your pastor wanted a weekend or two off, and so you're, you, got, you got me. <laughs> and and I, I don't know whether you, some of you may have heard, uh, two weeks ago I threw a, a rather large uh, pulmonary embolism and was in the hospital, the ICU and all that, and the Lord has been good to me. I started cardiac rehab this past week, and as I was approaching the pulpit this morning, Apparently, Pastor Kaufman didn't want me to miss a day of cardiac rehab because there's a 25-pound dumbbell in here. <laughs> so, but I'll wait until afterwards. You guys don't need to see that. It is so good to be here today to proclaim God's message of love and forgiveness for us and also to bring you the Lord's Supper this day. And I'm going, as I've told the ushers and the elders, I'm following your lead today. My job is to proclaim the gospel and give you the Lord's Supper. So I hope that... Uh, I don't mess things up for you and that you leave here today filled with the love of Christ and his love and forgiveness for you. Let us begin our worship. Our opening hymn is, this is new for me too, watching screens. I have still got my printed copy in case technology fails us. <laughs> so, our opening hymn, Come Unto Me Ye Weary. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we say we have no sin, 
we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us then confess our sins to God, our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you, no plague come near your tent. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Thank you. be with you. Let us pray. 
Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, your mercy attends us all our days. Be our strength and support amid the wearisome changes of this world, and at life's end, grant us your promised rest and the full joys of your salvation through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The Old Testament lesson for this fifth Sunday after Pentecost is from Zechariah, the ninth chapter. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore to you double. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle lesson is from Romans, the seventh chapter. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law, with the law, that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin which, that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want, when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God, in my inner being. But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. This is the word of the Lord. Please rise. We will join our voices in singing the Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 11th chapter. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. We confess our faith together in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father for all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, 
and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. We continue with the hymn of the day. I heard the voice of Jesus say. God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Sorry about having to slip out and put my stole on. We were having some difficulties with the technology before the service. We didn't have the service. <laughs> and so I got sidetracked and forgot to put my stole on. We found it, and now we're good to go. You know, sometimes the smallest thing can tell a greater story. So for example, your, your grandmother's hope chest stone markers in a graveyard 
this is going to sound weird, but I like to walk through graveyards and look at the headstones and read them. There is so much history there. Uh, I used to take my confirmation class up at St. John's to the old cemetery in Chatham, and we'd walk through there with the church directory and find the families from our church. And, and I would remind them that they are now saints in heaven. And when we come together in, in, in worship, we come together with the saints who have gone before us. A much greater story is being told as you look at these markers than just someone now lies here who lived and died. Well, as I say, these things can tell stories over great periods of time. And consider, for example, the chalice you see on the screen above you. This thing was buried in a homestead of a prominent Roman family. When Mount Vesuvius erupted in 79 AD, it was valuable enough to be buried in the wine cellar, but not valuable enough to be packed in their goods as they ran for safety. But this one small cup belonging to an unnamed Roman family told a much larger story. It told the story of Roman gods and human beings. It told the story of Rome and what it was like to live under the rule of Caesar Augustus. On one side of the cup, there was the image of Caesar surrounded by the Roman gods. He is seated and being handed the world by Venus and also winged victory, while Mars, the god of war, brings before him a multitude of conquered nations. Now on the other side of that cup, which I don't have an image of for you, um, Augustus is ruling over the people. There the image is one of mercy, not of war. Augustus is benevolently seated among the people before him as, they, as he extends one, his hand out to the people with the one hand, and then the other hand is a spear of protection. This image of the emperor has, was common throughout the Roman Empire when Paul wrote to the church in Rome. It was carved into marble friezes, printed on coins, and molded into ceremonial cups like the one you have before you. It helped people understand what it meant to be faithful. Faithfulness was the word used to describe the relationship between the conqueror and the conquered, the ruler and the ruled. The emperor held both power and mercy. In power, he would protect his people. Thus, we see him with that spear. In mercy, he would rule his people. So we see him reaching out with an open hand to his people. Power and mercy embodied in this one figure ruling over the people. And yet, he is only one small actor in a much larger story of the Roman gods. But when Paul wrote his letter to the Christians in Rome, he offered another story, a greater story, a story of another conqueror who rules over all people in power and in mercy. But unlike the lesser human god Caesar Augustus, the god of whom St. Paul writes is God of God and Lord of Lords. He writes of the God-man, Jesus Christ. This small portion of Paul's letter, I'm certain you all know it very well. One of my pastor friends refers to this as Paul's doo-doo text. For in it, he speaks of our daily struggle of being both sinner and saint. And we all experience it. The struggle of what, over what we ought to do versus what we actually do is real. And it is hidden in the heart of every single one of us. In our text, Paul writes of our desire to do what is good, right, and salutary according to God's law, while at the same time lacking the ability to actually do it. Thus, St. Paul writes, I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, some people recognizing this, they struggle with this, and they ask others to help them with accountability. Will you help me with my, my weight loss? <laughs> Whatever it might be, they ask someone to help them with their daily struggle of the doo-doo problem. I don't do what I ought to do. And frankly, whether we want to admit it or not, all people struggle with this. It's not something like that cup that can be left behind. The fact of the matter is that until the day that our conqueror and deliverer, Jesus Christ, returns, we will daily be engaged in this struggle of being both sinner and saint. Paul's description of the inner battle of sinner and saint 
is personal and it's individual. It tells the story of one man and one struggle that never seems to end. Paul knows the good that God desires of him, and Paul himself agrees with this desire. He acknowledges that what God wants is indeed good. Yet, he also discovers that he is sold under sin. Paul deliberately uses the language of slavery and of captivity. He says his members wage war, and he is captive to the law of sin. He knows the good he wants to do, but he's unable to do it. Instead, he finds that what he doesn't want to do, which is sinning against God and his neighbor, this is precisely what he keeps on doing. Why? He knows what he's supposed to do. You and I know what we're supposed to do. Well, just like you and me, Paul is a slave to sin, a captive to the flesh. And because of this, Paul cries out for deliverance. Who will deliver me from this body of death? But Paul's story isn't just the story of one man, is it? This is the story of all of us. It is the story of everyone who has lived and ever will live ever since Adam and Eve fell into sin. Paul's lament, Paul's lament is that of Cain. Knowing the good that God wants him to do, and yet also knowing the evil that is close at hand. His story is the story of Joseph's brothers. Knowing the good care and concern they should have for their brother, yet also knowing the evil judgment and sale of Joseph into slavery that eventually overtakes them. It is the story of David. Knowing the good rule of his kingdom and protection of his people that God desires, yet also knowing the evil pleasures of adultery and the murder that he would commit to cover it up. From individuals to families to nations, mankind's captivity to sin continues throughout the ministry of Jesus. It continues throughout the expansion of the church, and it even continues in our own lives today. Paul's story, his one small revelation of his own personal struggle as a sinner and a saint is actually a larger story and experience that we all live and know so well. This, however, is not the only story Paul has to tell. In fact, he has a much greater story that he wants to highlight for all people. It is the story of God's faithfulness in keeping his promise to send one who would deliver you and me and all mankind from this body of death. As early as mankind's fall into sin in the Garden of Eden, God began telling the story of his love. As Adam and Eve stood there, naked in their sin before God, ashamed of themselves and yet unable to hide, God began to tell his story. He began to speak of his love for mankind. Adam and Eve overheard it in a conversation that God had with the serpent. God said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and his offspring. You shall bruise his he head, his heel, but he shall bruise your head. Here is the first glimpse of God's merciful promise to deliver us from his wrath and eternal punishment for sin. Here is the greater story of God and his love for all mankind. He would send one, an offspring of the woman, who would deliver us by bruising the head of Satan and conquering evil in the fight. Adam and Eve heard God's promise, and believing it, lived in hope. The individuals, the families... The nations that followed them also lived in hope of this story of God's deliverance coming true. Thus, Paul writes his letter to the church in Rome to proclaim to them and to us that God's promise has been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Paul cries out, who will deliver me from this body of death? And then he answers the question for us. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. He delivers us. In this section of the letter, Paul lets his small story become part of a much larger and greater story. It becomes part of the story of God's plan of salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. For he is the one who came to deliver us from this body of death. We, we on the other hand, 
We delivered him up to death on the cross as Satan worked through us to bruise his heel. Yet he delivered us from death and from the kingdom of Satan as he revealed his power and his resurrection from the dead and called us into God's heavenly kingdom. Unlike the gods of ancient Rome, our God, the one true God, loves us, dies for us, and rises again to life in order to give us new life in him. St. Paul proclaims, Jesus Christ is Lord. And with these words, he invites everyone into God's greater story of forgiveness for sin and salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. For Jesus is the one who rules over all creation. He is the one who is greater than Caesar and Caesar's gods. For he himself is God. And there is no other God. And he came as our deliverer. And he is at the very heart of God's great story of rescue for his people from the slavery of sin and death. He is the fulfillment of God's greater story of redemption for all people in the world. You see before you another image. This image of Jesus as conquering ruler and deliverer of mankind was captured in a painting by an artist named Bartolomeo in 1516. The painting is called Christ and the Four Evangelists. Now, unlike that ancient Roman cup that I mentioned before, Christ is not depicted as engraved on the side of a cup, on one side telling the story of the gods and on the other side telling the story of humanity. <clears throat> Rather, Jesus stands on top of the chalice. He is depicted as both God and man ruling over the world. His one arm holds a scepter with a globe at the top of it. I don't know how well that shows up. His hand is like this, and you'll see a, a little spot up at the top. There's a globe and a cross on top of that. His other hand is raised in blessing. Through his death and resurrection, Jesus has accomplished salvation for all people. And now, risen from the dead, he rules over all things in love, and he offers his blessing to all the world. Now, for some, this image of Christ has lost the intimacy of the silver cup of Augustus. In that cup, Augustus is seated among the people, extending his hand in mercy to them. But in Bartolomo's painting, Christ is above the people. Even the four evangelists appear small compared to his higher and larger figure. And his hand is extended to blessing for the whole world, not just extended to one or two people. When this picture, by the way, th these were often referred to as altar pieces. And they would be placed above the altar, like your stained glass windows here, which I have sat in those pews and marveled at many times. These altar pieces would be placed above the altar, and this one, when it was placed above the altar, something amazing happened when the pastor consecrated the elements, especially the host. When the priest consecrated the host, you'll notice at the bottom of the picture there's a round circle, and there's angels on both sides of that circle. That circle is the world. And so this image of, the, of, the, of, of this, this image at the bottom, when the pastor would consecrate the host, then he would elevate the host and guess where it, take, it, it covered. Christ's body covered the world. This is the place where we meet Jesus. It visibly declared that the body of Christ is the place where God's people meet their Savior. Yes, he has ascended into heaven where he rules and reigns over all the world. Yet this same Jesus, crucified, risen, and ascended, is still among his people today. He is present with us, intimately and near to us, as he comes to us with his very body and blood, in, with, and under the bread and wine of Holy Communion. He is with us to deliver us from sin, death, and the devil. This is the wonderful message of the gospel declared by the evangelists. That Jesus is the deliverer promised so long ago to Adam and Eve, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is the great deliverer, even of sinners like you and me, who, like Paul, desire to do what is good, right, and salutary, but lack the ability to do it. Out of his great love for sinners like us, Jesus mercifully raised up his hands giving his life on the cross in payment for our sins. And then, 
Then he rose again to life, so that all who believe in him may be delivered from the slavery of sin and have eternal life. In him alone, we find our rest from the never-ending struggle of being simultaneously sinners and saints. Thus, in today's gospel lesson, Jesus invites you to come to him and see him as he truly is. He says, first he prays to his father, and then he speaks to his disciples. He prays, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your will. And then he speaks to us. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and everyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. My friends, here at his table, in a very tangible way, Jesus brings you into the heart of the greater story of God's love for sinners. Here, as we gather for the Lord's Supper, he connects us to the much greater story of God's loving rule over all the world. For this is the story of Jesus, our promised deliverer, who comes among us with his word and sacrament, that we may be included, incorporated into his story, his story of mercy, love, and forgiveness for sinners. The one who rules the world has mercifully lifted his hand in eternal blessing. And at his invitation, we now come and receive his very body and blood for the forgiveness of our sins, just as he has promised. Yes, we come before him with our smaller private stories of unfaithfulness and shame. The moments when we failed to do, to do the good that we ought to do. The times when we did the evil that we knew we should not be doing. But we also come trusting in our deliverance by the blood of Jesus. For he is faithful to keep his promises. This is my body. This is my blood. Given and shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. Yes, here at the Lord's Supper, Jesus joins us to his much greater, the much larger story of God's story of salvation for the world through his son, Jesus Christ. As we lift the cup of salvation to the Lord, his power, his blessing, and his mercy extends to each of us, and he continues to rule over all things until he comes again in glory to claim us as his own. Amen. Please rise. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We continue with the prayer of the church. <coughs> Let us pray. Our God and King, as once your people received you in joy, open our hearts to rejoice in your coming, so that we may, we may meet you in your word and sacrament for the forgiveness of our sins and the strengthening of our faith. Help us to bless and extol your name before the nations and to declare your salvation to the generations to come, proclaiming that you are merciful and gracious and abounding in steadfast love. Our merciful God and Lord, you are good to all your creation. Continue to bless your church and to provide for her faithful pastors who will preach and teach your word and church workers who will serve, serve us in your name. Make bold our witness before the nations and help us to act in love toward our neighbors. Our creator and Lord, from you all things come and to you all things are directed. Provide for our nation faithful leaders who will hear and heed your law. Protect and defend the citizens. Preserve the precious gift of liberty and inspire us to use our freedom honorably. Make us mindful of the heritage our forebears have given to this land and guide us to be faithful in our stewardship of all the resources you have provided. Our wise and giving God, you are the God of truth and in you is no falsehood or deception. 
Help us to delight in your law, to love what is good and true and right, and to seek after these things. Help us to wage war against the old Adam within us. Restore us when we stray from your word, and forgive us when we give in to the devil's temptations. Our compassionate Lord, we do not suffer alone the pain and afflictions of this life, but we live them, we, we live them out within your grace and are sustained by your mercy. Hear us on behalf of those who are sick, those who suffer, and the grieving, including Randy and George Ann Kessner, as they mourn the passing of Randy's father. According to your will, deliver them from their afflictions and give to all your strength, patience, and hope that they may endure to eternal life, show compassion, and drive all pestilence from our land. Our loving Father, you provide for our daily bread and meet our needs in abundance. Give your rich spiritual blessings to all your people, especially to those celebrating birthdays this week, including Steve Johnson, Braden Smith, Abigail Blount, Ramona Joseph, Heather Chapman, Bailey Woods, Eric Newman, Amanda Laddage, Allison Jenkins, Keith Coe, Gemma Coe, Steve Laddage, Charlie Swain, and George Ann Kessner. Our Heavenly Father, and gracious God, as we come to the table of your Son, your Son has set, grant to us faith and repentance so that we may receive with joy and thanksgiving his flesh in this bread and his blood in this cup. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may receive with our lips, that, that what we receive with our lips may keep us in holy life. All these things, blessed Lord, we pray, grant to us according to your merciful goodness and for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We continue with the service of the sacrament. The Lord be with you. Lift up your heads, your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection open to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name of Je name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood, as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Lord, remember us in your kingdom, and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. the true blood of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May this true body and this true blood strengthen and preserve you in the one true faith unto life everlasting. Depart in his peace. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this saving gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same, in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.